since Marion focused on basically the organization today and also the past history, I thought I'm going to talk a little bit about the transatlantic connections between Germany and uh, the African and African American community uh, in the post-war decades. And uh, Mitchell, in his paper, was also already hinting at the fact that there was a lot of um, engagement going on with people from the Netherlands, being in New York and being influential there within the socialist movement. And I want to look at just some of the other aspects. And basically three things I'm going to focus on is uh, number one, the support of people in Germany of the African-American civil rights movement, including Martin Luther King. Then second, sort of uh, the, uh, the other transatlantic alliance, because at the same time that the governments were building up NATO uh, and sort of having a very strong anti-communist focus, there was a student alliance being built uh, between the German student movement and the American and African-American student movement that was going politically in the total opposite direction. And then in the end, I'm going to focus a little bit on the Angela Davis campaign um, that uh, Marion focused or briefly mentioned already. Well, uh, to start off, the presence of more GIs, black GIs in Germany and also the large media coverage of events going on in the United States, such as the Montgomery bus boycott, really for the first time, I would argue, brought a larger German public to really sort of become interested in what was going on in the United States with African Americans. And some of the people there really became quite supportive of the struggle, especially those who had already sort of fought racism during the Nazi era. And I think a very important point that um, you made earlier was that it really is about um, recognizing the humanity in people and not sort of prescribing that only a certain group, the Aryan whites, are the true human beings and everybody else isn't, whether they are Jewish or black. So it's, it's I think, quite noteworthy that uh, one of the Protestant ministers, Heinrich Gruber, who had already been sort of at the forefront of fighting the Nazis and help, trying to help Jews during the Nazi time and was hiding Jews and actually spent over three years in a concentration camp, was one of the people who was very interested in helping Martin, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King or just being in contact with him and identifying with him and with the struggle against racial injustice. And, um, he he started corresponding with King already in the late 50s and in the early 60s, I just want to give you a quick quote of a letter he wrote to Dr. King. And uh, Heinrich Gruber was writing, I write in the bond of the same faith and hope, knowing your experience are the same as ours were. During the time of Hitler, I was often ashamed of being a German, as today I'm ashamed of being white. I'm grateful to you, dear brother, and to all who stand with you in this fight for justice, which you are conducting in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And he invited Dr. King to come to Germany. And Dr. King accepted the invitation and came to Berlin in September of 1964. And he was enthusiastically greeted by everybody. However, as Marion already mentioned, it's quite interesting to see how then the government, the West German government, or specifically at the time Willy Brandt, who was the ruling mayor of um, Berlin at the time, tried to kind of utilize King for their own purposes. You know? So they were trying to present King not only as sort of a hero of the black freedom struggle, but sort of more of an icon of, of American freedom standing against communism. But King kind of was um, very careful to sort of avoid being utilized in this way. And he gave a, a sermon or an address uh, in front of over 20,000 people at the Waldbühne here in Berlin, really talking about um, that the struggle was, uh, you know, a struggle against racial injustice and any kind of injustice, that it was a struggle for humanity. And one thing he said in the end was, I quote him here, that Berlin was for him, quote, a symbol of the division of man on the face of the earth. Because he felt very strongly that one should always look at the humanity and see every person as a child of God, no matter what political outlook people had or uh, what skin color they had. Anyway, King afterwards, though, and this was very unexpected to the Westerners who had invited him, went over the border and preached in East Berlin at St. Mary's Church. And the reception there was even more enthusiastic. I mean, there was a crowd of several thousand people that didn't even fit into the church that was listening to him. And people were so excited and just loved the fact that he was there. And again, the interesting thing is that the government didn't come at all. You know, in, in East Germany, he was 
greeted enthusiastically by the people of the GDR, but not by the government officials. Because even though GDR propaganda at the time always tried to present African Americans as the oppressed, the other Americans with whom one should sympathize, you know, because of course there was no racism in socialist GDR or social, you know, the socialist uh, um, Soviet Union. But at the same time, King for them was not a, a uh, because he was not an outspoken anti-capitalist and because he was a Christian, they distrusted him. And they thought also that his way of speaking out against state authority and for speaking for freedom might give some of the GDR people the wrong idea, namely to also protest for their freedom. And one could say maybe they were right, because even though at the time King's visit didn't really seem to have any instant big repercussions, in the long run, it did really inspire the Christian oppressed uh, communities in the GDR and the GDR opposition. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, 20 years later in the 80s, the song We Shall Overcome, which is, as you all know, the kind of anthem of the African American Civil Rights Movement, became the marching song of the uh, GDR opposition during the marches they had, especially in Leipzig in September of 89. So that's a thing um, worth to notice. Um, now to my second point about the university students. What happened was that after, remember, sort of trying to bound the populations together of East and West Germany, uh, Fulbright programs and other programs brought a lot of German students to the United States. But what probably, again, the government officials who invented these programs didn't expect is that a lot of these students really sympathized with American student movement. Um, and uh, quite a few of them became very involved with Students for Democratic Society, SDS, uh, and with SNCC, the, um, the African American Student Movement in the South, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And one person, for example, I just want to mention is Michael Vester, who actually became so involved with the SDS in Berkeley that he was one of the main authors of the very famous Port Huron Statement, you know, very anti-racist but also anti-colonialist and um, uh, anti-imperialist statement. And what happened was that a lot of these students, when they went back to Germany after a year or two, they, and this is I think where you see sort of the connection, they took a lot of the strategies and the methods used by SNCC to then organize their own student protests in Germany. You know, I'm not just talking about demonstrations, but for example, the whole idea of sit-ins, of lie-ins, of swim-ins, of march-ins, of blockading, this whole idea of non-violent mass resistance is something that really inspired the German student movement that then, as you know, all got really off the ground in the mid-60s and late-60s. Um, and what you see there is the radicalization at the same time in Germany, of course, there were other things happening. People found out uh, the past of quite a lot of government officials who had what we would call a very brown history. They had all been deeply involved with the Nazi regime. And uh, so now they were still in power and uh, the German student movement in 68 became more radicalized and you all may have heard the saying unter den Talaren, der Muff von tausend Jahren, because also university professors, a lot of people were deeply in, in had been deeply intertwined with the Nazi regime. And uh, so uh, the students there were protesting again and uh, they were starting to form alliances, uh, for example, also on the level of what they really saw as this in international imperial uh, uh, coalition of Western governments, German gov the German government with the United States government. And one issue that really got everybody riled up was the Vietnam War. So the German socialist student uh, movement, together with a lot of uh, uh, American students and African American students, in February of 1968 here in Berlin organized a huge Vietnam Congress. And there were quite, a, what I find noticeable about this is that people like Dale Smith and other people from SNCC were over here, together with Rudi Dutschke. And together they were building what they called a new front against what they really saw as a global agenda of fighting racial justice and freedom from imperial op oppression. And at the same time, the German students also founded a Black, the Black Panther Solidarity Committee. Because this was a time also when, as you all know, the Black Panther Party was starting to be really harassed by the FBI and a lot of people were thrown into jail. So the Black Panther Solidarity Committee uh, dis um, um, disseminated information about this, collected money to get people out of jail, and uh, so um, did a lot of that. 
And then, of course, um, there was an escalation again in 1968 because the German government, trying to get a cap on the student movements and, and other protests, passed the emergency laws in March of 68. And uh, that kind of was a trigger again for the student movement to radicalize because they thought this is really starting to get like fascism. And uh, only a few weeks later, on April 4th, 1968, as you all know, Dr. King was assassinated by a white assassin. And uh, that really, again, was a trigger point for a lot of people saying, you know, this is enough. Nonviolence doesn't work. You know, you can see people are just being slaughtered. And some of the people who were deeply involved with the um, Black Panther Solidarity Committee, um, one of the persons was Gudrun Enslin. And together um, with Andreas Bader and Ulrike Meinhoff, they founded the Red Army Faction, which, as you know, was a terrorist organization that tried to really overthrow what they felt was a fascist government by terroristic means. And uh, um, don't get me wrong, I'm not implying at all that one should compare them to the Black Panthers. Certainly not, they had a totally different agenda. But one thing that's very interesting is, is how, the, uh, how the RAF really, again, tried to kind of appropriate some of the, um, uh, some of the methods and the, the language of the Black Panthers and the way they dressed. And for example, they appropriated the logo of the Black Panthers, which is a Black Panther jumping forward. In the logo of the RAF, at least for the first few years, you saw the jumping panther together with the Russian Kalashnikov. And you know, the whole thing, how they used the language, calling policemen pigs and always showing around their guns. It was sort of very much modeled at the Black Panthers. But I find it very interesting that at the moment when the, um, when the leaders of the Black Panthers, uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, kind of renounced that kind of terrorist violence, the Black Panther was taking off the logo of the RAF. So that's just an, an, an interesting development. Um, just finally getting to my last point, another thing that the Black Panther Solidarity Committee did was that they were very involved in the campaign to support Angela Davis in the early 1970s. So I, I guess everybody is familiar with what happened to Angela Davis or does anybody not know? No, people know. So Because they, I just want to stress again the strong German connection because I think what some people don't know is that Angela Davis actually studied in Frankfurt. She spoke fluent German and she was very connected with a lot of the German members of the Black Panther Solidarity Committee. So after she was being on the FBI's most wanted list and had to flee and was arrested, a lot of people, it kind of pulled together for maybe even the first time a really huge international campaign to help a person of color who was being imprisoned by the US government because a lot of her friends really feared for her life. If she had been spoken guilty for that shooting in the jail with these guns that had been registered in her name, she could have faced capital punishment. So there was a huge movement in Germany and the uh, students in Frankfurt um, organized uh, uh, an, a campaign, uh, an Angela Davis Congress that over 5,000 people attended. And one of the statements they made that I find quote worthy, so I'm gonna share it with you, um, was um, that, that the Angela Davis Solidarity Committee in 1971 said, I quote, the German people especially have a right to be educated about the ongoing racism in the world. And precisely those who have made their inner peace with the Jews should consider that their credibility depends on their willingness to fight without compromise against the social causes of racial discrimination wherever it appears. Which is a statement I think that has still not lost much of its validity today. And uh, what's interesting there is um, to see how basically solidarity with Angela Davis was seen as an indicator of a true anti-fascist and anti-racist mindset. Yeah, and again, so uh, this campaign reached a lot of people and thousands attended the rallies and donated a lot of money. And there was a lot of pressure put on the Nixon administration. And what's interesting is now looking again at the GDR is that uh, contrary to Martin Luther King, the GDR government completely embraced Angela Davis because of course she was not only 
a, an African American, but she was also a member of the Communist Party. So she was like the ideal person for them to identify and support with. So the government in the GDR organized a huge Angela Davis campaign. There were thousands of letters written, school children painted uh, postcards with sunflowers for Angela Davis. Thousands of them were sent to her, uh, to the jail. And uh, so there was a huge official and also public um, uh, safe Angela Davis campaign in the GDR. And when um, Davis was finally acquitted on June 4th, 1972, Erich Honecker congratulated her with a personal telegram sent to her right away. And he invited her to come to the GDR, um, which she did. She came um, to the GDR in the fall of 1972, and she was enthusiastically celebrated as the heroine of resistance against capitalist oppression and racial oppression. And she was made the heroine of, of an official documentary movie. She received an honorary degree from the University of Leipzig, and she was awarded the great star of friendship among the peoples by Walter Ulbricht. So you could say that the uh, GDR regime at the time kind of uh, used uh, the Angela Davis issue to, to create her as a communist superstar. And she, at the time, kind of accepted that honor. It's interesting, whenever she, um, she's now, as most of you will know, um, a, a professor of history and women's history and, uh, at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And I've watched some interviews where people asked her how she sees that today, you know, how she was kind of all uh, being celebrated by uh, the GDR government, and she kind of declined to comment on this. So, but, but it's interesting how the different government try to utilize people for their own purposes. And uh, yeah, we can go on later, but looking at the clock, I'll stop it right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.